The most insane shit ever happened. Someone took several shots at Donald Trump before being killed by a Secret Service sniper. An actual assassination attempt. Before we go any further and talk about what happened and what people have been saying about it, let's just get this out of the way. Political violence is vile and has no place in a civil society. One innocent man was murdered as a result of the shooting, and that is terrible. It is. It's not funny. It's not good because he was a conservative. It's just tragic. With that said, there's a lot of angles to cover with regards to this historic event, so let's talk about it. I think a good place to start is, who's the guy who tried to end the life of Donald Trump with a bullet? Why did he do it? Well, his name was Thomas Matthew Crooks, a young guy just a few years out of high school. According to conservative politicians and pundits, he was a radical Biden supporter, as if those exist. But the truth lies much closer to home for them because Thomas Matthew Crooks was a Republican. So what can we say about this horrible red-on-red -red violence? We might never know exactly why he did it, because he didn't leave behind a manifesto and his social media presence was scarce. However, let's run through what we know about him. As a teenager, Thomas Matthew Crooks has been described by some old classmates as a loner who didn't really talk about politics. But others have described him as being staunchly conservative, having conservative friends, and wearing articles of clothing related to Trump. The Philadelphia Inquirer reported the following. Max R. Smith recalled taking an American history course with Crooks as a sophomore. He did recall Crooks making political statements, but they shed no light on his actions Saturday. Quote, he definitely was a conservative. It makes me wonder why he would carry out an assassination attempt on the conservative candidate. End quote. Smith recalled a mock debate in which their history professor posed government policy questions and asked students to stand on one side of the classroom or the other to signal their support or opposition for a given proposal. Quote, the majority of the class were on the liberal side, but Tom, no matter what, always stood his ground on the conservative side. That's still the picture I have of him, just standing alone on one side while the rest of the class was on the other. End quote. The former classmate also recalled Crooks as generally kind and intelligent if reserved. Quote, everyone is in shock. He was so quiet, I wouldn't imagine him doing that. But I guess that was the same deal with Columbine, end quote. How come people always describe, like, the exact profile of a mass shooter before saying how surprised they are that they're a mass shooter? Like, oh yeah, he was a reserved and quiet kid who stood apart from everyone else. I couldn't imagine him shooting people. I, for one, thought that social butterfly Brad, who spent his formative years making friends, would be the one to mow down strangers while attempting to assassinate a former president. It takes people skills to murder, after all. At any rate, Pittsburgh's NPR news station further reported the following. Paige Updegraff, 20, said she went to school with Crooks and was in classes with him, including a health class and a PE class. She said he had a, quote, quiet, raspy voice, end quote, and mainly hung out with and spoke to a couple of other boys. Quote, I feel like I really only saw him talking to the same people. I don't really think I ever saw him go out of his circle, end quote. Updegraph says they were interested in the military and ROTC as a way to get into college, and they sometimes wore clothing that showed off their interest in the military. Updegraph also said that she was pretty sure that Crooks himself or one of his friends wore a pro-Trump shirt while in eighth grade. Quote, I would almost put money on the fact that I probably had seen him wear a Trump shirt or something along the lines of that beforehand, which is why this is so shocking to me. End quote. Okay, so to summarize, he was a loner with a small friend group of like-minded individuals, he and his friends were conservatives who had an interest in military, and at some point they supported Trump. I mean, that is rather confusing as to motive for trying to shoot Trump. 
but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's put a pin in it for now. Instead, let's continue with what we know about Thomas Matthew Crooks. Specifically, let's talk about the thing on which conservatives are hanging their entire argument that Crooks was a radical Biden supporter. At the age of 17, he made one $15 donation to Act Blue on the very day of Biden's inauguration. This suggests to me that he probably lost a bet. This is conjecture on my part and on the part of Twitter, but my bet is that he believed in the right-wing conspiracy theory that the election was stolen and that Biden would never become president, because Donald Trump would gloriously rise up and take back his rightful place as president. And I bet that he bet with one of his friends that Biden wouldn't become president, a bet he lost and had to make a meme donation to the Democrats for. Other rumors online posit that the donation was actually made by another Thomas Crooks, considerably older than the shooter, but I've seen conflicting evidence that seems to suggest it was indeed the shooter who made the donation. So the question is, could the theory of a lost bet hold true, or did he change his mind and become a radical liberal later in high school? Well, no, he didn't. A few months after making the donation, he registered as a Republican on the day he turned 18, and he was a registered Republican ever since, up until the day he died. Conservatives claim he did this to vote against Trump in the primary as a sneaky, sneaky Democrat, but this is their feeble attempt to explain away the fact that he was a Republican who all through high school was a conservative. He registered as a Republican years before any primary in which he could vote against Trump, he voted as a Republican in the 2022 midterms, and then he never voted again. He never voted against Trump. Because conservatives are wrong when they claim he registered as a Republican only to vote against Trump. Because conservatives don't want to admit that he was one of theirs. The final thing we know is that during the assassination attempt, he wore a Demolisha shirt, which is merch from the gun-focused YouTube channel Demolition Ranch. The channel is not, as far as I can tell, explicitly right-wing, but the culture of its audience absolutely is, and the person who runs the channel associates with open conservatives and reactionaries. It's not exactly a secret that the right has a, uh, let's call it an unhealthy fascination with guns and all things gun-related. Just to be absolutely clear here, though, I am not saying that Demolition Ranch is responsible or that this channel incited any kind of violence, because I don't think it did, or I don't know that it did. I am mentioning this only as a puzzle piece in understanding the mind of Thomas Matthew Crooks, who by all accounts was a right-winger. That's pretty much all we know. He was a conservative who was a registered Republican from his 18th birthday until his death the only discrepancy being a single $15 donation to Act Blue on Biden's inauguration day. To get anything further out of this, we're now going to have to move into the territory of pure conjecture. So what I'm about to say is guesswork that could absolutely be wrong. I have several theories about what I believe could have been the motive for the shooting. To start with the most conspiratorial one, in other words, the one you shouldn't take too seriously, it is entirely possible that the shooter never intended to harm Trump and only wanted to metaphorically but not really martyr him by staging an assassination attempt. I am not saying that the assassination attempt could have been staged by the Trump campaign and the Secret Service, as many have suggested online, because that's honestly an insane thing to believe. To get that narrative together, you'd have to believe that a bunch of different people in the Trump campaign, in the police, and in the Secret Service are in cahoots. Which, just no. A person died because the shooter used live ammunition that got lodged in the man's brains. It was a real shooting, and I don't believe all these different people, including Trump himself, would put themselves in the line of fire. No, what I am saying is that maybe the conservative shooter was acting alone and never intended to hit Trump, only make it seem like he wanted to hit Trump. As far as I'm aware, Trump was only hit in the ear by a piece of glass shrapnel, not a bullet. Hmm. Curious. But now that I've indulged my conspiracy sweet tooth, 
I believe it's much more likely that Thomas Matthew Crooks wasn't just a conservative, but someone who was radicalized so far to the right that even Trump seemed like a moderate to him. Trump is a far-right fascist, and he does have support from neo-Nazis, but there are plenty of neo-Nazis who view Trump as a poser, a fake right-winger, especially after Trump meekly distanced himself from Project 2025 and is strongly supportive of Israel the state that a lot of neo-Nazis consider to be a Jewish symbol that needs to be destroyed. Trump is a dangerous fascist, but he has a history of flip-flopping, at least in rhetoric, between calling neo-Nazis good guys and calling neo-Nazis bad guys. I don't believe for a second that Trump ideologically is a neo-Nazi. I don't believe he wants to exterminate Jewish people specifically. He is a fascist who wants to dismantle democracy and violently oppress minorities, but there are freaks out there for whom that isn't extreme enough. It's entirely possible that Thomas Matthew Crooks was one such freak. He certainly fits the profile, a young white male loner with a known history of conservative sentiment and a fascination with firearms. Another theory that also relies on Thomas Matthew Crooks being an unhinged far-right weirdo is that he was an accelerationist who believed that the assassination of Donald Trump would be the starting shot of the Civil War. Just listen to Alex Jones and Ivan Raikland discuss this exact thing on Infowars just a few short months ago. To every single person on the deep state target list, my assessment, Ivan Raikland's assessment that if you assassinate any political presidential candidate, whether it's RFK, whether it's Trump, guess what? America will do the following immediately. They will respond in kind, and they know who you are because we've created the list. So if you go and that's to a major measures, Rubicon, they should know that immediately. You're going to see immediately response, and there are only a few buildings in Washington D.C. that they will probably do that. Well, I hope that's not the case, but these people are crazy. And having said that, if they do that, option two behind Trump is going to be so much better for us and so much worse. Well, I was about to that. say, if they kill him, that's best case scenario from a sick level, from a sick level beating him. Oh, please kill him, which I don't. I mean, but it, it's so good after that. Oh, <laughs> it's going to be the, the, the best cleansing and the fastest cleansing that we've ever seen in my lifetime. I, get, I, I assess with almost certainty, with the highest level of confidence, that if they assassinate Trump, it is so game over for them, and it's gonna be so fast. The best and fastest cleansing we've ever seen. That's how they describe the events that would follow a potential assassination of Donald Trump. And they're wishing for it, they're hoping for it, because they want a cleansing. They want political violence. They want their political enemies to lie dead at their feet. Or preferably, at the feet of someone else who listens to their hateful rhetoric and acts accordingly, does the dirty work for them. It is entirely possible that Thomas Matthew Crooks soaked up rhetoric like this from Infowars and other reactionary commentators in the right-wing echo chamber, and acted accordingly. Another theory I've seen floating around is that Thomas Matthew Crooks may have targeted Donald Trump because of his association with Epstein and credible accusation of child molestation, including the rape of a 13-year-old girl. It's certainly possible, but it's not what I personally believe in large part because right-wing concern about child predation is never actually concern about child predation. It is, after all, conservatives who want teen girls to be pregnant and married. It is Republicans who push bills to allow adults to marry teen girls. And let's be honest, it is often conservative public figures who are outed as predators, and the right never cares about that. Instead, the specter of child predation is just something they use as a cudgel with which to attack LGBTQ people, who they claim are pedophiles for simply existing. Likewise, the right doesn't care about rape or any kind of sexual violence. They often use it to paint minorities as threats to white women, but when confronted with the reality of sexual violence and rape culture, they defend it. 
the right viciously attacks rape survivors and sought to delegitimize the Me Too movement. That's why I find it unlikely that Thomas Matthew Crooks cared about Trump being a rapist and a pedophile, but you never know. In fact, we may never know exactly what motivated Thomas Matthew Crooks, but it's important to get this simple point across. Whatever exact form of political mental illness motivated him, he was a right-winger and a conservative. This is important to acknowledge, because the right has been furiously typing out unsubstantiated claims about radical leftism being at fault, further deepening their collective psychosis and their belief that the deep state is trying to assassinate their divine leader Donald Trump, and downplaying and justifying their own deeply rooted political violence by pointing to this supposed example of a left-wing assassination attempt of Donald Trump. So let's talk about the conservative response to the entire thing, because it's been interesting. I've seen conservatives get thousands of likes on tweets calling into question the competency of female Secret Service agents who risk their lives to protect Donald Trump. But not just the competency, actually. Rather, conservatives have questioned these brave women's right to even be there, calling them DEI hires that will never and can never be as good as the men. They haven't stopped to criticize Donald Trump for risking the lives of Secret Service agents when he insisted on stopping to do his dumb fist pose, but they've hyperfixated on female Secret Service agents, looking over their behavior frame by frame. Why is she making this face? Why is she short? Why is she fat? Just absolute rank misogyny and not a grain of gratitude for women who risk their lives to protect Donald Trump. Conservatives just can't help themselves, because their entire ideological framework is fundamentally built on opposition to diversity, on politicizing the existence of women and minorities as a means of returning to the glorious past. But the bulk of the right-wing narrative has been that the Democrats, the left, and journalists caused the attempted assassination through vitriolic language aimed at Trump. You people have called him a fascist and a threat to democracy for years, so this was bound to happen, the narrative goes. Which is rich coming from the right. The argument is dumb on its face because the implication is that you can't criticize political figures for their actions and beliefs if they're too extreme. Like, you can't call a spade a spade if the spade is a fascist. Trump has already tried to overturn the democratic results of an election with a fake electors scheme and inciting his violent supporters to storm the Capitol on Jan 6. And the Republicans' political platform is categorically fascist, not least in how it targets LGBTQ people. But you can't say that, because that incites violence, or so they say. However, the elephant in the room is, of course, that the vast majority of political violence comes from the right. This is a statistical and categorical fact. And right-wing public figures, including politicians and commentators, incite this violence at every turn. They do so by painting all the minorities they don't like with the broadest of brushes as essentially evil and as existential threats. They say queer people are child-grooming degenerates. They say brown people are foreign invaders coming to rape white women. They say black people are thugs that want to riot, loot, and burn down the cities. They say that the Democrats are un-American radical left fascists slash communists that cannot be allowed to win or there will never be another election. They say that Joe Biden wants to ethnically cleanse all white Christians and whatever other bullshit they can throw at the wall to see what sticks with their radicalized base of supporters. That's something Trump himself has espoused. Yet when Republicans are criticized correctly for their fascist rhetoric and their fascist plan to dismantle democracy and strip women and minorities of rights, now suddenly this incendiary rhetoric is too hateful and causes political violence? The fact of the matter is that it is the right that cultivates, at every turn, a culture of vitriolic hatred and glorification of political violence. The right did Jan 6. The right wanted to hang Mike Pence for not going along with Trump's insurrectionist plot to steal the election and overthrow the democratically elected government. The right spread conspiracy theories about a stolen election and the need for civil war. The right laughed when a maniac tried to bludgeon to death Paul Pelosi. The right cheered on as police and right-wing agitators violently assaulted peaceful campus protesters. 
Right-wingers like libs of TikTok paint big targets on civilians, schools, hospitals, etc. by equating being queer with being a pedophile. And there is a clear pattern of bomb threats against their victims that follow this targeted harassment. Right-wing politicians like Mike Collins and Marjorie Taylor Greene release political ads where they use guns to shoot at and blow up targets representing their political enemies, implying quite overtly that guns are a viable option to use against opposition. The right celebrates and lionizes murderers like Kyle Rittenhouse or the man who shot protesters blocking a road or the guy who choked out a homeless performer in a subway for 15 minutes until he died. The lives of these victims of political violence were not lesser than the life of Donald Trump, yet their deaths are celebrated by psychopathic right-wingers who have absolutely no regard for any human life other than their own. It was a Republican who said just days before the Trump shooting that, quote, some folks need killing, end quote. The conservative movement is defined by rhetoric that utterly dehumanizes and demonizes minorities and political enemies, rhetoric that narrativizes the existence of entire demographics of people as an existential threat that needs to be fought, that there's a civil war coming, that, as Mark Robinson said, some folks need killing. Even the guy who was killed at the rally, Corey Comparator, spent his last years on this earth spreading vitriolic hatred online, wishing death upon strangers for protesting climate change without impeding anyone, calling a black woman a DEI plant, supporting the wanton murder of bicyclists, fantasizing about the deaths of political enemies, and callously ridiculing the millions of Palestinians who have lost their homes and in many cases their entire families with the words, quote, they'll get over it, the Japanese did. End quote. He's not a hero for being murdered by another far-right extremist. He didn't deserve to die either, but he, like many other conservatives, participated in the perpetuation of a tradition of violence that ultimately cost him his own life. The conservative movement also has policy platforms that match their rhetoric, of course, and they act in accordance as well, because it's not just words. Thousands of bills that target queer people for the crime of existing, the revocation of abortion rights as a means of control over women, forcibly separating parents and children coming over the border looking for a better life, tossing them in cages not fit for the lowliest of animals, even sadistically mutilating female refugees with unnecessary hysterectomies forever robbing them the choice of having children. That's something ICE did under Trump. Muslim travel bans. Quote, when the looting starts, the shooting starts, end quote. Gallows erected outside the U.S. Capitol building. Or let's look forward at Project 2025, a nearly thousand-page document detailing exactly how they're going to create their glorious conservative utopia, including calls for mass deportations so far-reaching that it's hard to call it anything other than ethnic cleansing, the stripping of rights from queer people to effectively raise them from public life the stripping of rights from women to reduce them to stay-at-home moms whose entire personhood is defined by other people, namely their husband and children. And that's hardly scratching the surface. Let's not forget the parts of Project 2025 that seek to undermine and dismantle American democracy and American institutions, to pack the entire government apparatus with ideological loyalists. You know, for example, people who will stop the Environmental Protection Agency from protecting the environment at a time when we're racing toward cataclysmic climate change disaster that threatens the lives of hundreds upon hundreds of millions of people. Project 2025 even wants to stop research into green energy and go all in on fossil fuels, because of course it does. The Republican Party is pushing an ideology that fundamentally seeks to reduce human beings into permissible conservative archetypes of what they think people ought to be like, and erase and criminalize anyone who exists outside of those archetypes. That is, on a very fundamental level, violence. Using the full power of the government to force LGBTQ people into the closet for fear of not just persecution but prosecution is violence. Denying trans people the medical care and medicine they need is violence. Prosecuting doctors who provide medical care that contradicts conservative dogma is violence. Forcing women, including teen girls, to carry to term pregnancies they don't want is violence. 
using the power of the state to round up and deport migrants, desperate and poor people looking for better lives, is violence. It shouldn't take a boatload of empathy to understand just how terrible it is to be subjected to that kind of persecution, not just at the hands of reactionary bigots at the fringes of society, not just by weirdos online with nothing better to do than to systematically and intentionally misgender trans people and send rape and death threats to women they don't like while hiding behind the anonymity of Roman statue profile pics, but by the entire culture of the country that the right wants to foster and by the state that holds the monopoly on violence and can end your life with the pull of a trigger or the injection of a needle. Violence comes in many forms and the right peddles in all of them. I don't want to hear from any right-wingers about how words are violence because mean words about Donald Trump caused a shooting. Your entire political framework is one of violence directed at the most vulnerable people in society. You revel in it and laugh at the violence directed toward the degenerate freaks whose existence runs contrary to your idea of what it is to be human. Fuck you. To everyone else, thanks for watching. I had a lot to get off my chest. Like and subscribe as it would really help my channel grow. As always, thanks again and see you next time.